Okay, so before we get this Q&A started, I just wanted to show you something. Imagine here are the pages on the left-hand side. So I grab page number six. Let me go ahead and highlight page number seven as well. I go up to the background color. Let's say that I want to make them black. I do that. Shape tool right here in the middle. Let's go to a circle. I draw a shape. I select it. Let's change that into a white shape, why don't we? One of the things that gets lost in this software, there's one white circle. Not to say this is the be-all, end-all technique, but you know what? You might want to use it. I'm going to do a second circle. Select that, make it white. I'm going to go here, go here. And now look, I can do this, but also look, when I click on this, I can move it backwards, and now I can change the direction of those. I could also, if I felt like it, do this, and then say, well, maybe I want that one to go back behind it. Mm, I don't know. I look so darn good. Maybe I should put this in here, move this around. Maybe when I select this, I'll go down to the auto image adjust just for fun and see what that looks like. But maybe that's too obnoxious. Maybe you're like, God, you do look really good. Too good. Send it to the back. And I can do that. And I can just move things and layer things around in BookRite software. When you're making journals, what could be better? You're welcome. We're sorry. The number you have reached is not in service. Please check the number or try your call again. This is a recording. <laughs> hey, what's happening? Thought I'd start out with a little tutorial because I was in a good mood. Have I mentioned my love of fanny packs? Yes, this is a Code Epoxy fanny pack, which is kind of like my cycling birding fanny pack. And um, it's pretty good. Fits on the small of my back when I'm cycling. Doesn't lay on the top of my back like a backpack, so it's pretty good. But it's not waterproof. And um, now that I have an X100V, as you all know, uh, waterproof, think about this. Think about a waterproof fanny pack because the only thing I can think of that would be cooler than a fanny pack is a waterproof fanny pack. Before I get to the trusty Q&A and all my questions, uh, I'm one person with one opinion. Thank you for everybody who sent questions in. I know this is a back-to-back Q&A. I haven't really done any other kind of films, although that's a lie. That's not true. I didn't mean to lie to you just then, but I was lying to you just then because I've cut two of the three from the Van with Dan videos. Let me repeat that from the Van with Dan videos that uh, I do for Blurb, and they're kind of cool. One of them absolutely sucks, and my, my hope is that Blurb destroys it and destroys all traces of the fact that I was involved in any way, shape, or form. That's my film about hometown America. I gave myself an entire day to do that entire film, and uh, guess what? Didn't work out so well. Content sucks. The narrative and the voiceover that I did, it's okay. The content sucks. The second film I did about the biggest week in American birding, I kind of like it. I, th I was there for two and a half days, so I gave myself a little bit more time. I got more content. The light was better. There were more people. There's more going on. There was a lot happening. And then the third one I haven't started yet with is, which is about the influence of Gene Smith. His Pittsburgh project, Dream Street, is that influence on me as a photographer. I'll go back and talk about that. But oh, look at here. Look, look, got something in the mail. What do you know? It's another blur book. I want to say this is the 288th. I'm not doing really an unboxing. Creative books of every nature. Enjoy 15% off. Use 15% create. Look, there's a bird. That's pretty cool. I didn't know they were doing that. Want your book featured in a bookmark? Share it on social with blur books. Actually, that's not a bad thing. That's a cool idea. And a bookmark may come into play with AG23 in the coming months. Oh yeah, this is the journal I made from uh, Albania. This is a 8x10 Try to get it non-reflective. Eight by 10 trade book. I want to say this is 120 pages. Uh, oh, ho, 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 ho. Enver Hoxha, dictator of Albania. What's a journal without at least one dictator? Give me a break. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I found some hacks in the software. I found hacks in the Blurb software that let me do this and this. Yes, I was trying to recreate them earlier and I forgot how I did it. This is what I was showing you earlier, what you can do with the shape tool, black backgrounds, and the layering tool. That's pretty cool. God, this thing looks good. It's mine, so I mean, what should I expect other than pure genius? Let me see what the front says. Photographs, multiple exposures, Albania. Oh, just waiting to be inked over. Scratch and sniff. Mmm, yes, smells piney. Yeah, this looks good. And for those of you out there, I can't get neutral black and white. Yeah, you can. I did nothing special. Speaking of that, well, anyway, this looks great. 
I'm going to take this and uh, once I finish the journal I'm working in now, I'm going to start going through these pages and I'm going to start inking, writing, taping, gluing, all the things that I do to make these a one-of-a-kind thing. This is a blast. By the way, I like the 8x10 format. I shifted from 6x9 to 8x10 because more real estate, but also it lays much flatter. It's easier to work on if you're going to do that kind of thing in it. It's not like a photo book where all you have to do is sit there like adult looking at the images. No, this is an interactive thing. All right, maybe I should open my computer. Let's see here. Do I do the, the update now? Do I check my email? Nah, let's just go. Uh, who, who, who wrote me? Who, what, what mailing list am I on now? Gear Junkie. Somehow I ended up on Gear Junkie's mailing list. Did I sign up? No, but there I am. All right, here we go. By the way, this is a public service announcement before we begin. If you're trying to contact me, just go to shifter.media and use the contact form because I get so many emails and some of these emails I know people are trying to email me and it's ending up in my, my junk folder and I honestly don't have time to check that. So that's not a good way to get me. The phone is also a terrible way to get me right now because for some reason where I'm sitting, I'm averaging four days. My phone doesn't ring and four days later I get your voicemail. I don't know why that is. I'm not sitting in some remote third world outpost unless you consider Maine a remote third world outpost. I don't know, and some of you might. Maybe you have something against Maine. You don't like Mainers. You don't like fog and rain and big trees. I get it. There's a lot to not like here. So don't try to call me and don't try to text me and don't try to email me through Gmail. Just go to my site and use the contact form. I think pretty sure, 80% sure those are coming through. Okay, did I mention the X100V? Have I said to anyone, did I? Do you guys know I have that camera now? I do. And I've been, uh, oh yeah, before we go any further, I think this is about a minute and a half. So as I do with any new camera, I go out and I test it and I use it. I'm also refinishing a canoe paddle. So I've been sanding it and putting layers of waterproofing on it. I need to do another round of sanding and I need to put another round of waterproofing. Uh, it was gifted to me by a local here who knew that I was in the market for a canoe paddle and said, why buy one when you can refinish an old one? And we said, absolutely, let's do it. So that's kind of a mainer thing to do, refinishing canoe paddles. But I've also been out very, very, very limited times and moments with the X100. So just to prove my point, just watch this. It's a minute and a half. I'm not saying this is great, but what I'm doing and what this exemplifies is that I'm getting to know the camera. I'm only going out with this camera. And because of this, and because of this little film that I made, and also just things percolating in my head about size and weight and travel, I might commit to this camera for the Peru workshop in September. I might just take this camera just for fun. And uh, so then I could get down there and potentially regret my decisions. I don't know. Man, there's some serious fog rolling in. This is great. And everybody was like, we're going to the beach. And I'm like, I got to work. And two, yeah, suck it. The fog's rolling in. You guys don't deserve to go to the beach. If I can't go, no one goes. That's what I've learned. Christmas is not about giving. It's about getting. So get over it. Okay, watch this. <sighs> go ahead, watch it, and I'll be back after. Okay, crying is normal. You might feel a little pressure. 
So anyway, those are not world beater images. That's not a world beater film. That's just me tinkering, me testing, me trying. Does, can I shoot video with this handheld? There's no stabilization, so in some cases, I think from that film, I would say yes. And in some cases, um, in the back of a, a boat on the open ocean when there's a decent swell, probably not. Can't handhold it. Uh, stills look good. Stills look really good. Simple, small, light, quiet, easy. So anyway, here we are. Let's talk about, uh, what was this again? Q&A. Question number one. You shot 35 millimeter for 20 years, but then you went to the 50 millimeter. Why? Actually, probably shot 35 even longer. But remember, when I got, I started at San Antonio College in San Antonio, Texas, because another school lost my incoming transcript and had no record of me. And their dean of admissions called my mom and said, hey, he can't go here. We have no record of him. Go somewhere else first semester, then transfer in. So I went to San Antonio College. That's where I found photography. And I walked into the Ranger, the student newspaper, because I'd been given a small scholarship to be a photographer after one of their instructors saw some terrible pictures I made. And he said, hey, you want to be a photographer? I'll give you a scholarship. That scholarship was a grand total of maybe 50 bucks. And I was like, whoa, no way, 50 bucks. That sounds great. So I went there and I walked into the, the range of the newsroom and there was a guy in there, a photographer named Rudolfo Gonzalez, who went on to become a very good photographer. And Rudy looked at me, he handed me a screw mount Nikkor, Nikkor mat camera with a screw mount 35 millimeter and a printout of the Sunny 16 rule. And he was like, here's your exposure guide, don't screw it up. That was the love and nurturing that we got as photographers back then. So I started with a 35, but when I got into the news, newspaper business and the news world, at the time, this was right before the zoom lenses came into play. So the 20 to 35 to 70 to 200 pioneered by Canon with autofocus, those had not landed yet. 80% of everyone I knew shot Nikon, and pretty much everyone either shot 24, 28, 35, 50. There were lots of 85s, there were lots of 180 millimeter 2.8. That was kind of the quintessential long fixed lens that every news photographer had before you made the jump up to 300 2A. Never in my wildest dreams that I ever think I would ever own a 300 2A, and to this day, I have not owned one. I did have a 180 2A, but I was a 24 millimeter, 35 millimeter guy when I started in the news biz. And I always had two cameras and two lenses. And then when I got rid of Nikon and I went to Canon, I did go to the zooms, the 20 to 35, eventually the 70 to 200. And those were fine for newspaper stuff, but I, I never made the kind of work that I wanted to make with those lenses. I'm not a zoom guy. Zooms suck. No, not really. They suck for me. They may not suck for you. You gotta test it, you gotta try it out. So anyway, I shot, uh, when I left the newspaper world and I sort of left photography totally in 1997, I quit and I took a job at Kodak I sold all my equipment except for a Leica and a one lens, which was a 35, because I traded someone an old 70 to 200 Canon 2.8 lens for an M6 and a 35. That guy got the worst deal in the world. I tried to talk him out of it. He wanted to do it. I got it. I was the recipient, M6 35. Used it forever. Then I got enough money to buy a second M6 and a 50 mil. And this was after trying two or three different 50 mils with varying various lines of brands over the years. I could never make it work. But when I committed to the Leica in the 35 and the 50, very slowly it began to become apparent to me that I kind of saw the world in a 50 millimeter uh, view, viewpoint. The 50 was a chameleon lens. You could shoot wide open and make a portrait and have nice fall off, or you could shoot at f8 and really tie different elements of a scene together with foreground, midground, and background. It was like this perfect blend of utility in a lens. And so I shot 50 forever. And I think if you ha if you forced me and said you can use one camera and one lens for the rest of your life, I don't know, maybe it would be an M, like a, my M4 with a 50 mil. That would be a pretty good thing. The bummer is that I don't really shoot film much anymore. Logistically, it doesn't work for me. But it was through years and years and years of using the 35 and the 50 together. I always carried those two bodies and two lenses pretty much all the time because Traveling and going to do projects, you, you really don't go with one camera in one lens. Not to say that you can't only use one camera in one lens, you can, but you always have to have something as a backup. And when you're trying to create a project, when you're trying to make an in-depth project in a limited amount of time, it's often easier to have two bodies and two lenses because it's just faster. You don't have to take the time to reload. When one is running low, you grab the other and you can make two different looks of image in a very short amount of time. So you're sometimes forced into using more than, more than one camera. That's how I felt anyway. And if you don't feel that way, sign off now because I don't even want to know you. 
This, this whole site is about me and what I want, secretly. Have you figured that out yet? Me, me, and me. Enough about me. What about you? How do you feel about me? Okay, uh, that's why I shot 50. Question number two, is AI the beginning of the end of photography? I hope so. I hope AI comes in and just devastates what is what little remains of professional photography. I hope it just wipes it down. Again, the guy in Jaws nails down the chalkboard. I hope it just cleans off even the, the, the residue of professional photography and design and illustration and food service and healthcare and yoga and everything else. I hope AI comes in and we never have to do yoga ever again. I can just, I can pay my attack bot to attack the yoga studio instead. That sounds great. It's not like some people are saying AI is gonna kill all of us. I mean, that's not happening at all. What could possibly go wrong? No, I think, look, it depends on what you're talking about. If you're asking about photography in general or you're asking about professional photography, I hate to break it to you. I already know people in photography, in design, in marketing, in illustration who've already lost their jobs and also have, I know entire teams of people who were let go because of AI already. This has been happening for a long time. But the end of photography as we knew it or as we thought about it or think about it probably happened when Photoshop came along. You know, digital technology was kind of a precursor to this whole thing, but really more importantly, the internet. The internet is killing all of us. So AI can come around and take out photography and will it really matter when we live in a post-truth culture where people believe anything they wanna believe. They'll believe the tooth fairy is real. If their you know, leader or whoever their spiritual guide is in the world tells them that's what's happening. So I, I'm not worried about AI and photography. I'm just worried about us as a species. So photography digs its own grave most of the time. And sadly, and this is gonna be a little tough love, for those of you professional photographers out there, this is definitely gonna be some tough love. There's probably gonna be some hate mail from this one. But at, the, at the, the root cause, at the heart of many of the worst problems in photography are the photographers. We make terrible decisions. And historically, this has always been true. Photographers have been taken advantage of. Often, if you look at big productions, the photographers treated differently than anyone else. Um, and there's been case study after case study. There have been famous websites about this. There have been famous stories about photographers being taken advantage of. This is just the latest in a long line. But also remember, this is the hot topic of the day. And you have people right now who are positioning themselves to make as much money as possible off of AI in the photography space. So it's happening. It, it's already been happening. So whether or not it kills photography, no, I don't think so. It, it's just another hot story of the moment. And, um, you know, hopefully it wipes us all out and we can start over. I'll see you in the rubble. Might want to dig in. Do you know how to set a defensive perimeter? I don't know. Maybe you should Google that. That might be a good idea. Number three, how do I prep files for blurb? Okay, this is an important question and one I've spoken about a little bit in the past, but the thing about prepping files for Blurb is I keep it as simple as humanly possible. And oh, by the way, look at these things. That looks pretty darn good. I did nothing special for any of this. Did nothing special. Oh wait, let me show you this. Albania is not in Russia, just in case you were wondering. I didn't do anything special to prep these files. All I do is keep in mind that if I'm sitting with my monitor, first of all, my monitor is calibrated. I know there's someone out there right now going, yeah, 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 but I don't calibrate, but, yeah, but, you are a but if you don't calibrate your monitor. You have to calibrate your monitor because the human eye is this amazing adaptive machine that can sit in front of a monitor that's 30 points cyan and eventually tell you it's neutral gray. So unless you calibrate, you don't know what you're looking at. It's not complicated, it's not expensive, it's not difficult to do. If I can do it, you know my track record with technology. It's not good. It's bad. It's like Trump telling the truth. Does not happen very often. So if I can run a, a, a software to profile, you could do it too. So profile, number two, keep in mind monitor density. Density is the, let's say brightness, for those of you layman's out there. Looking for a layman's term, let's talk about brightness. Most of the time I sit around with my monitor brightness jacked all the way up.
because I'm doing email and I'm doing Zoom calls and I'm doing conference calls and I'm surfing the web and I'm looking at my own website and I'm Googling my own name and looking at all my accolades and saying, God, I'm so good. So, so good. My parents are proud. If they were really concerned about what I was doing, they might be proud. Yeah, who knows? Anyway, calibrate your monitor. Keep monitor density in mind. You're going to export JPEGs. I export JPEGs that are at least the size of the publication that I'm making so that the software has no need to interpolate those files for me. I think this is applicable across all software. You typically don't want a software to interpolate for you. You want to provide the software with enough information right off the bat. sRGB JPEGs, um, I'm doing very, very, very small tweaks in post-production. I typically apply, apply a preset that I have made. I have a black and white preset. I have a color preset, and it's very simple. I go through, I one-star the images that make the initial cut, then I'm typically narrowing shoots down to three, four, five images total, so applying those presets and exporting out to those file types that I need for Blurb. That's it. I don't do anything else. There's no need to do anything else. As you can see by this journal, they look great. But the calibration thing is important. And a ton of people over the years, including a lot of professionals, have said to me, oh, I don't calibrate, but, you know, my inkjet printer in my office looks fine and I never calibrated for that. Well, guess what? Your inkjet printer and going out to an HP Indigo machine are two separate color spaces, two different destinations. I don't care what your inkjet printer looks like. It has no bearing on what going a file going out to an HP Indigo is. Now, for those of you who really want to confuse yourselves, and I can feel it, I've got some of you in my audience, you're looking to complicate matters. It's like, here, take this money. And you're saying, no, I'm not so sure. Take it, always take the money. There is a downloadable ICC profile for Blurb. My advice to most of you, don't download it. Don't use it. You're gonna confuse yourself and turn yourself inside out. And oh, by the way, didn't use it, haven't used it in years. Now I don't use it because oftentimes in person, jaded, unhappy, angry people will come up and see my books and say, oh, well, you work for Blurb, you get special treatment. So these books look great because you get special treatment. Those angry, unhappy people are never gonna use the profile. So I don't use the profile. So when they say to me, oh, you use the profile and you know how to use the profile, and blah, 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 I'm go, I don't use it. And then it, it's like a balloon popping. It's their pride and ego and I don't know, their will to live just spilling out on the floor. You don't need the profile, but it's there for those of you who are more in tune and more dialed into very, very specific kind of printing, but again, you don't need it. Uh, it's more just monitor calibration and density and you're gonna be fine. Number four. Oh, this is good. Remember last week when I mentioned the snapshot and I paused and I waited because I could feel the hate coming through the screen of all the people who were like, you bastard, what are you talking about snapshots? Ah! Like you blew a head gasket, like the alien, the white hydraulic fluid spraying all over your office. Do you remember what I said after that? I like snapshots. I like them. I think they're important. I wasn't trashing the snapshot. Hook kick. I wasn't trashing snapshots. I like them. But a snapshot is different from what I would call an image of intention. If I was assigned to photograph the, my neighbor who lives right there, young guy, musician, really got to hang out with him for the first time last night. He's a filmmaker too, by the way. If I was assigned to photograph him, spend a day, 24 hours in the life of that guy, I'm gonna be making, I'm, I'm, I'm working a scene with him, a 24 hour moving, living, breathing scene where I am, he is my singular focus and that is what I'm focusing on. Those are not snapshots. Those are images of intention. During that 24 hour period, he might say to me, hey, I used to, I grew up with this guy, get a quick portrait, boom. I'm not, I have no interest in that as part of the body of work, but for him it's an important image and boom, I shoot it, that's a snapshot. Or I'm, we're driving someplace and I see a canoe out the window and I'm like, I should come back later tonight under the cover of darkness, cut that chain and steal that thing. Yeah, quick snapshot out the window. That's an important thing because I'm coming back to take what's not mine. Those are not images of intention. They are not better or worse than one another. They're just totally different uh, intentions with that work. So someone was asking very specific questions about like Lindsay Adario on the border, Ukraine and Russia shooting, are those snapshots? I would assume that she's doing exactly the same. Her primary mission is to tell a photojournalistic story and she is head to the grindstone 
trying to make those images of intention. But along the way, she potentially, maybe she's even using her cell phone for the snapshots and whatever, her DSLR or her mirrorless camera for the work of intention. Everybody does that, bouncing in and out, in and out, in and out. To me, I'm after the intention images more than anything else, but I'm also a journal keeper. So the snapshots are amazing for the journal. I'll even show you, you jackals, you jackals, current journal. Look at that sucker, huh? Look at that, current journal. Have I mentioned my the pen that I like, Uniball Jetstream Sport? Albania is not in Russia. Oh, look at that, look at that, look at that. Snapshots, wait, 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 wait for it. You know I'm, I got me and the birding in there. That's it, I'm not gonna show you any more than that. Anyway, snapshots, those are the difference between the two. Again, not necessarily better or worse than one another. I think both styles of photography can be very important. Number five, oh, this is tough. Oh, wait a second. Okay, I got number, question number 10. Don't let me forget. It has everything to do with Kevin Costner. Number five, Salvador or under fire? Impossible to answer. They're both perfect cinematic experiences. Perfect, but very different. I cannot answer that. I've seen Salvador and Under Fire probably 50 times each, dating back to when those, almost when those movies came out, which now is a long time ago. James Woods, who's turned into a total whack job, as I think his name was Peter Boyle. Not, maybe not Peter Boyle. Boyle was his name. He was based on a real character. Jim Belushi is Dr. Rock, his sidekick, DJ from San Francisco. They bail. Go, Woods tells him we're going to uh, Guatemala. They end up in El Salvador to cover the war. What kind of, what other movie in the world have you ever said, hey John, can you spare a couple rolls of Tri-X? That's it, that's five star. That permanently lands in the Hall of Fame. And by the way, I don't know if James Woods was a whack job back then, and I'm talking right wing conspiracy whack job. That was a masterful, masterful performance. Uh, and I mean that in all seriousness. I think he was nominated for an Academy Award for Salvador. I think he could have easily won. I love, there's so many scenes in that movie where I just looked and said, James Woods has to be like that in real life because it's so accurate and his mannerisms and style, I thought it was fantastic. That movie was a nightmare to make apparently. It was really dicey getting in and out of where they were shooting and uh, people got sick and there was no budget and they had to rewrite the script at night. You know, just the way good things should be, like Apocalypse Now. There's a scene in there where he's going to confession because he has to try to marry his Salvadorian girlfriend and he's already married to another woman who's left him at the beginning of the movie. And he goes into the confession house and the priest is like, well, if you love this woman, you have to change your ways. And he goes, he goes, yeah, that's, that's going to be a little hard. And I was like, I love it. I, that's like the best scene of that character. He goes, and the guy's like, if you love her, you change your ways. And he says to the priest, well, I can still drink and take a couple hits off a joint, right? And I was like, that is exactly how the human brain works, especially in a maniac like that. So I loved Salvador. But in terms of photography and how they handled the photography and how the character actually carries cameras and uses cameras and the sort of dialogue and the dark room and how images are used and not used, I think Under Fire is, is superior in, in that sense. And it's, it's Nolte before he went off the rails. Nick Nolte was a god, if you didn't know. By the way, have you ever seen The Deep with Nolte and Jacqueline Bissett? Holy cow, I saw that in middle school. I was never the same again after I saw Jacqueline Bissett more than anything else. I love The Deep as well, but Nolte was a stud. And for any of those who came into, any of you who came into photography at the same time I did, the wars in Central America were front and center in America. It was Salvador and Guatemala and Nicaragua and the threat of communism and, and Rio tank divisions on the Rio Grande and all this nonsense that the U.S. government fed to everyone, the Contras and the whole Iran Contra uh, uh, scandal. This was front and center and it made a lot of careers photographically. There were a lot of people that worked in those situations that went on to become very, very famous photographers, historically great work coming out of those terrible situations. And so I love both of those movies. You can't go wrong. You cannot go wrong. If you try to tell me that one is better than the other, hook kick, right there. I need a sound effect. Just like in the, man, I used to watch like kung fu movies on beta. Think about that. I watched kung fu movies on beta. I would go to the video store with my dad and he would just like shake his head in resignation that his, his youngest son was a kung fu freak. And I would get all these like weird, um, you know, poorly dubbed 
Chinese kung fu movies on beta. Remember, remember the team beta thought that they were going to defeat team VHS? And then they got hook kicked. Wham! Okay, number six, which Instax do you use and how do you attach your prints and what journals do you use? So I use the Instax Wide, that's my favorite. And in terms of adhering those prints into the, into the journals, I use glue. I use an archival clear glue. It's nothing fancy. Occasionally I will use tape, I like colored tape. But most of the time I travel with a big glue stick and I just glue them in. And it's, it's kind of crude and that's what I like about it. It's not perfect, it's not fancy, it's simple. You can get glue sticks anywhere in the world. Not a big deal. And I use, uh, I use very inexpensive journals that come in packs of like 20 and these are from um, I bought them on Amazon I don't think there's an actual there's probably a brand name somewhere on these things but I don't know where that would be they're just nondescript little journals they got a little yeah they're fine they're just little little tiny journals nothing nothing fancy you can use anything you can use a three ring spiral notebook you can use the old composition books from the five and dime doesn't matter who dating myself five and dime terrible uh, number seven, this is a question about Austin Photo Labs, Austin, Texas. For those of you who don't know, for, the, for you Americans, just know it's, it's, um, it's right next to New, New Jersey. It's about barbecue and photo labs. According to my source, who is a very famous photographer who lives in Austin, arguably one of the most famous working today, who happens to be a friend, I reached out to him. You're welcome. He said Holland Photo, H-O-L-L-A-N-D, Holland Photo is the only lab in town. He said Smitty's Market in Lockhart is a go-to spot for barbecue and Davis Barbecue in Taylor as a recent discovery and it's a step into another time and the food is killer. That's from a very famous local that I reached out to because I haven't been there in 30 years. I don't really go to Austin anymore. I typically go to San Antonio and I avoid Austin just because it's, I knew it when it was a town and it's a city now and it's, it's just big. It's like another big city. So San Antonio, I've got another big city right in front of my face. So I don't typically end up in Austin. Question number eight, what is your stance on photographing or not on your first day in a place that you've never been? Do you quote, waste a day soaking it in or do you make some images? In my case, making magic, always magic. I get the camera out, poof, take a picture, always magic. No, I shoot any opportunity I can. However, my expectation level on day one is often not high because I've talked about this many times in the past. I think that there's something called photo fitness. You have to be photographically fit to make your best images and that is something that you don't just turn on. It's something you have to kind of shoot yourself back into shape. It's like, a, it's like Reggie Miller from the three point line. You know, Reggie Miller may not come out of the locker room and nail his first shot. He's got to warm up and get into it. And that's the same thing for me photographically is the first day I often see images that I should have shot and I just missed it. I wasn't fast enough. So no, I try to get up to speed as quick as humanly possible. I don't want to waste, waste a day. And in fact, thinking about, let's say the, the Peru workshop, I can think of multiple images off my head that I made the day before the workshop even started. That, that are in the actual body of work that I made from Peru. And the same thing applies in Albania. I was shooting in the days, I got to Albania two or three days before the workshop this year. And I'll, I can actually show you. I'll show you, damn it. Jackals don't believe me. I made this double multiple exposure, triple exposure. I made that the day before the workshop started. So yeah, I go for it. Time, no time to waste my friends. We're all on a clock, and as you get older, that clock gets faster and faster. Uh, number nine, I have access to a native village of 700 people in Brazil and will be able to return for several visits. What techniques or strategy should I use instead of wandering around and making random photos? What's your story? I don't know your story. Just because you have access to a native village of 700 doesn't mean you have a story. There's no possible way you're going to cover a village of 700 people, so that can't be the story. So what you have to do is determine what your story is. And then you're no longer random. Then you're absolutely drill down on that story. It could be one person. Now, if you don't have a story and you don't know how to come up with a story, the easy thing is to say, I'll shoot portraits. I'll do portraits and then boom, 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 boom in a short amount of time, 
you can build a body of work. This, my friends, sadly, has been very evident in the past 20 years in photography. When I came out of photography school, and here's the part of the presentation where I hearken back to the good old days and the golden ageism of photography and why we were so much better than the young punks of today. No, not better, different. When I came out of school, the projects that we did as documentary photographers were long-term projects, right? People looked at, you know, Salgado was a 10-year guy. A lot of other people were five-year, seven-year kind of things, two years. No one did projects very quickly. But when the internet came and digital technology came and the idea that becoming famous as a photographer became something that people thought was attainable, all of a sudden the style of documentary project changed. And all of a sudden you saw the portrait series suddenly as the new form, nouveau riche, new wave of documentary photography. I would go to Perry Photo in Paris in November and it was one portrait series after another. The reason people were doing that is it, it doesn't take time. I can go into a town I've never been in and in a two day period I can make an entire body of work shooting portraits. That's impossible if you're doing reality based, long term, people based work. You might have to be there for two months two years to make that kind of work. And people are like, I need to be famous by tomorrow at 3 p.m. Um, how do I do that? Oh, all these people are shooting portraits. Um, I guess I'll buy a four by five and I'll start shooting portraits. And then I'll talk about the technique and about how I'm going back to film. All these tricks and, and schemes and scams to try to build relevancy in a short amount of time. Personally, I think doing a portrait series is a good idea because shooting pictures of strangers freaks a lot of people out. There's, there's tricks to it, there's techniques to it. So you could do that going into a village, I don't know, but you know, the, it's a hard question for me to answer because there hasn't been any narrowing down of the kind of thing that you're after where I can say, oh, look for these two or three things. So just going, getting access to a village, you really have to come up with a second level or second layer to this project that will give you an idea of where to hone your efforts. What are we at? We're only at 35 minutes. That's pretty great. I just haven't been rambling at all. That's good. I feel like I can take a nap. Actually, you could probably see me if I took a nap. Would you mind if I just took like just a quick 12 minutes? Just 12's all I need. Okay, last question. Ooh, it's hot in here too. The humidity today just went, went, to, went to 11 today outside. The last question is very, very important very important. Top three Kevin Costner films. Super easy. Number three, No Way Out. Number two, Bull Durham. Number one, easy, slam dunk, Fandango. If you haven't seen Fandango, you are a loser, an epic loser. It's by far the best Kevin Costner movie. It's a great movie in general. I think it speaks about many, many different things. And it's classic Costner back when he was a scrawny, wisecracking guy, great cast, funny, but also moments of poignancy about the Vietnam War, about pals, about friendship, and about how life changes no matter how hard you want to cling to the way it is today, it's going away. It's all going away. We're all going to suck and we'll probably get electrocuted, which is not part of the film, but you know what I'm talking about. And then Bull Durham, classic. Classic. There's so many lines from Bull Durham that my friends and I spit back and forth all the time. I think that's a great movie. Also great cast. I love baseball. I love farm team baseball. I much prefer farm team baseball to the major league. And I've covered both, and I much prefer farm team baseball. And then No Way Out, I thought was a decent movie from the 1980s. Uh, there's probably other Kevin Costner movies I'm forgetting about. I hate golf. I hate everything to do with golf. I covered professional golfers, and of all the athletes I covered in the professional field, golfers were the worst people I've ever encountered. They were spoiled country club brats. No matter where they were from in the world, they were just awful to work with. And it always left a bad taste in my mouth. I don't like country clubs. I don't like golf courses. I don't, I'm sure if you put me on a remote island and I was able to play golf and I was trapped, I might like it, hit a ball with a crooked stick and walk after it. I'm not sure, I, it's just not my thing. So he has made a couple of golf movies that people seem to love. I've never seen either one of them or, or, or I don't know how many there are exactly. I'm guessing, I think there's two. I think one was Tin Cup and something else I can't remember. What else? Dances with Wolves, John Dumbear. I, you know, that was okay, but still, it's not gonna get in my top three. And by the way, this, somebody's gonna ask me about this television series, Yellowstone. 
I think it's called Yellowstone. It's the, it's the Western series that Kevin Costner is in or was in. I can't keep up. No, I don't watch it. And here's the thing, I don't watch any of the Western series. The problem is I lived in the West and 20 seconds into these films, everything is wrong. Their vehicles are wrong, their clothing is wrong, their dialogue is wrong. Do you know what cowboys wear during the day a lot of times? Tennis shoes. Yeah. If you're irrigating a hay meadow, you're wearing tennis shoes or you're wearing rubber boots. You're not wearing cowboy, cowboy hat and a vest and chaps and, and looking like an 1850s cowboy. It doesn't happen. And people don't wear new clothing all the time. When I was a kid in the American West, cowboys had a work outfit and a townie outfit. And sometimes they had a car or a truck that they only drove to town. In our case, it was a Pontiac Grand Prix. There was the only car on the property. Everything else was a truck. The old timers that worked for us, they would wear the same clothes every day. They were filthy. And then Friday night, they'd take a shower and put on their towny clothes. They had one outfit, jeans, pressed shirt, different hat, different set of boots. And often they would have a, like a fancy pickup, but not fancy in today's terms, just clean, like a second truck that would only be driven to town on Friday night. So these shows are like Hollywood productions where you have a, a clothing and a casting person and they're, they're dressing them as if there's an Armani outlet on the corner in Montana. It doesn't make any sense to me and it rubs me in the wrong way. I don't like uh, things where there's not attention to detail. And I haven't seen Yellowstone, so maybe I would be pleasantly surprised how everything would be perfect, but I really doubt it. Because Hollywood doesn't know anything about the West, even though a lot of the elites live in the West in these second and third homes. And by the way, we can thank them for putting up fences and no trespassing signs and also uh, paying off state officials so that they can close off uh, water to the rest of us. So if you're a trout fisherman, you know what I'm talking about. You know how much of the best trout water in America has been sold off to private landowners and little behind the scenes things where it's like, hey, I'll give you guys access to it, but do me a favor, let me put a barbed wire fence across this public access road and keep the riffraff out because I'm super rich and I want this trout water in myself. Vast majority of best trout water in America is on private land, sadly, and it's dropping fast. So in New Mexico, place I used to fish a couple of years ago, rich guy went in, bought a piece of land, put a barbed wire fence across the public road, and nobody stopped him. And it's happening more and more. Hey, hey, let's talk about something positive here at the end. My work and how amazing I am. 120 pages. This is going to take me a long time to get through this. Let me see if I can find an image I like. I'm a stickler. Stickler for my own work. It's got to be good. A lot of this is not stuff that I would, I would ever use. You want to talk about snapshots? Both of them. Snapshots. But it works as a journal spread. I'm not putting that work in front of you and saying, oh, that's just amazing. This is a little better. This is a little bit more intention. I just love the fact that this woman is about to take a header right into the river. That guy's doing everything in his power to keep her from doing that. Multiple exposure in the middle of a market. I kind of like that. A picture of intention. Ooh, this is the backside of the dictator's house in Toronto. Yeah, I just looked over the fence and there it was. Could you call that a snapshot? Yeah, I think I shot two frames. One of them was tilted for some reason. Maybe I had too much Rocky that night. But that's pretty simple. But in the context of the story, it becomes more than a snapshot because I just told you. It's the backyard of the dictator who ruled Albania for 50 years. The backyard of his house that's, I just looked over a fence and boom, there it was. Okie dokie, I gotta get back to work here. I just wasted another seven minutes of your life. And uh, again, I'm one person with one opinion and thank you to everybody that sent questions in. I might be back. And I'm gonna release these from the Van with Dan films. I'm gonna release the birding one, which I think, oh boy, I gotta go. Wife just landed, it's over. My life as I knew it is no longer mine. We're sorry, the number you have reached is not in service. Please check the number or try your call again. This is a recording. <laughs>